Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I can ask you just. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So uh, if I can ask all the panelists to please join me on stage. We're a little bit behind on time, so I'm going to accelerate a little bit uh, uh, as well. Uh, it may impact some of the questions that we may ask uh, or allow the audience uh, to join as well. Please, Mr. So-called, please, please join us. If I can ask all the panelists to please come and, and grab a seat. Uh, as they come and sit and join us, and I'll introduce them uh, as I present them, let me just set the scene a little bit. Uh, everyone has had someone uh, close to them has suffered from, you know, a uh, horrible disease. And actually, I know people, uh, uh, in fact, an official who's quite young, who uh, has a neurological history of a debilitating disease in the family and hello, can only hello. be just a you know typical hello, sir. just I don't know where that's coming from but uh, it could just be a uh, time bomb uh, and can be addressed and we heard yesterday the power of AI and data how this can be treatable and how it can be curable and this is where uh, the data act and the AI act has to get it right uh, to do so. And today we're going to be talking about another very important regulation called the European Health Data Space Regulation. And uh, before I want to jump into it, I just want to share what this uh, regulation can pretty much address. If we just look, and I'll give you just a couple of statistics. Four million uh, European citizens were diagnosed with cancer each year. And that number is going to go up to over five million in less than five years. Uh, we're going to be seeing chronic diseases uh, that are going to take 80% of health budgets, so that's about 700 billion. Um, and we're seeing more and more medical deserts where there is no treatment. In my home country of France, it is very hard in some areas to even see a doctor or get nurses or get care. And digital can help address that and can help address the missing 10 million uh, uh, health practitioners that are going to be missing by 2030. So I want to just jump into it. Um, I know that I had polls, but we're going to skip the polls, so I'm sorry. And we're going to just introduce uh, Francesco. Uh, Francesco Bonanorate, he's the CIO of uh, MIA for Janssen. And maybe uh, if we can keep all our opening comments very short, but if I can ask you, Francesco, uh, what value can private companies, academia, and patient groups deliver in a European health data space? Well, I, I speak here, um, I, I think, in, in 2021, together we, we found the DEC, which is the Digital Health uh, Council at uh, Digital Europe, which was bringing a very diverse group of traditional healthcare companies, but also tech companies and, and uh, companies that have interest in health and digital technologies, recognizing that change uh, and the convergence that we have uh, on technology and science for the first time, uh, which we enable to address problems that we were not able to address in the past. And this is, comes also reflected in two papers that we brought in the two most crucial topics. One was also addressed by the uh, Minister of Japan. So when we speak about digital health, trust is the basis, and there was one paper, and the second the same, uh, why we are here, which is uh, innovation, to bring very, very profound innovation uh, with patients at the center. And, and that's, I think, we, we, I mean, we believe that in the next 10 years, there's the possibility to address, uh, to bring more solutions that we were able to bring in the 90 years before. Uh, and I think crucial is why we are here on the European Health Data Space to speak, which is one opportunity for our continent uh, to take the lead in innovation. Okay, well, you know, thank you very much. And, um, uh, you know, in regards to what you're seeing in the European health data space, and someone from a very important, you know, company that's operating here in Europe, uh, what uh, conditions uh, do you see that would be necessary in this regulation for it to be effective, not only economically, of course, but socially? Can you give us some views? Well, I mean, first of all, we believe this is a team sport mm -hmm. in the sense that we will need the European Union, we will need the member state, we will need the civil, uh, civil society and industry to work together to realize um, the possible, so to implement the European health data space. 
Um, I believe we need an harmonized framework, or we believe that we, <laughs> uh, we need an harmonized framework where we maintain and we keep and we preserve uh, the promise uh, of making secondary data available for research. Uh, and in this, I think we are also supporting uh, a very clear governance. Uh, one of the crucial questions of the European health data space is how do we access the access bodies in the, single, in, in the single member state. And here we need governance and clarity, and, and I think we endorse also the creation of an authority at the at European Union level that govern this one. And this is not only the industry position. Uh, I think we are very proud that together with Digital Europe, we, we got 35 uh, NGOs signing on this principle, uh, including the European Patients Forum. Um, that's, I think, all based on experience of the past. We believe that the harmonization framework is key for success of this. Um, and in a consent statement, we have highlighted also other area, I think for sure we need clarity and cost-effective and trustworthy access to secondary data to boost innovation in the European health data space. There is a very complex question that we need to address. There is a lot of legislation, some is already existing and some in, in the coming, and we need clearly, horizontally and sectorial uh, interplay for European health data space with the other legislation. I mean, uh, GDPR, uh, to, to, to stay general, but also with the Data and Governance um, Act, with uh, also specific sectorial regulations like the medical device regulations that at the end we don't have, we get burdened from all the directions, but we have clarity and, and one way to go. And also, at, at the end of the day, also we believe that for the success, uh, and we were mentioning before, uh, when we were speaking, we were meeting in a close group. Uh, I mean, it took some time, for example, in Finland to implement something very similar. Um, I think it's, uh, I have in mind, it's, it's the team sport. We, we need everyone to participate to the implementation and, and perhaps the creation, what we see, the possibility to the European Health Data, uh, uh, Data Space Board to have participation of different bodies to bring different expertise for the success of this implementation. And last but not least, which was mentioned, uh, I'm very happy to see the, the, the Ministry of Japan, uh, that we don't put additional burden on, on the international flow. So research, uh, we, have, we are here in, the, in Europe and we want to, have, uh, to, to, to maintain Europe as best class, but as we have seen, and it's very, got very visible in COVID, it's, it's a global sport where we, have, we need the best mind in all the continent to, to address the problem, uh, health problem. Francesco, thank you very much. Um, we heard from just the previous comment from the United Health Group, so, so definitely thank you to Optimum for making those comments, where data can have practical uses. And I'm going to ask you later on, so, so keep some ideas in mind, of how you're going to use this data for such practical uses. Um, and thank you for talking about the consent statement. It really was an organic discussion amongst 35 patient groups that came together uh, the European Patient Forum was one of the signatories. Uh, they led that, and uh, uh, we, of course, supported. Um, and it was very, very straightforward on seven different areas where we came together uh, and agreed upon. So, uh, you know, there is this kind of discussion that there's a lot of you know, differences, uh, and there, of course, are areas where we don't always agree, but there were some clear areas on the benefits of the EHDS, and I'd like to introduce Anka Thomas, thank you for joining us from the European Patients Forum. Uh, you are executive director uh, at the EPF, and I'd just like to talk to you about, you know, what are you expecting from this health uh, data space uh, regulation, and um, how will it benefit patients? Okay, well, and uh, what do we expect? We expect impact on people's lives. We expect that the data uh, will be used the way patients want it to be used, which is for good. Uh, that's the most important thing. Um, and we expect that this legislation will drive innovation that it's needs, needs driven and not the other way around. I think that's quite important because we're here and we talk a lot about data, but data is people. And when our patient organizations, when, when their members, uh, when our members share 
um, personal data and it goes into a secondary use, what patients expect that this will improve their conditions, that it will improve other people's conditions, and that it will be used to produce patient outcomes. And I think this is the bottom line that we really must remember. This is not just about an abstract thing, it's about people's lives. So um, we expect a people-focused legislation and how it can deliver um, by creating common standards, by improving the, the, the way data already circulates, by putting some order into that and bringing it into a research space that answers real questions asked by real people, and uh, by improving the primary use, uh, the, the, collect, the data collection, I mean, the, the discrepancies you have there, by building trust, um, by being transparent, uh, that's, that's one of our most important asks, the transparency of, of, uh, of data use, the way data is used. Now, in a secondary use perspective, from a secondary use perspective, we're talking about big data and it can be really abstract. Um, but um, that amount of data, and we see already uses of it, can generate discoveries that can really push. Some of them are expected or, or sought, some of them are unexpected, and they can really uh, improve people's lives. So that's what we want, and that's what we expect. Impact, really. It, 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 it's an excellent comment, actually. And I wanted to highlight that when the uh, GDPR was being negotiated, the Article 1.3 was member states cannot restrict sensitive data from going over borders. But unfortunately, or maybe it was for some very good reasons, uh, there was articles later on, two of them, that allowed member states to create their own rules, and that created a lot of barriers. So this regulation is trying to address that, which, which I think you're right. Yes, there's so much richness and diversity in the EU that it could lead to important discovery. And, and I'd like to talk to you, you know, I'm gonna come back, of course, but I'm, a couple of questions I'd like to ask you is, how do we build that trust with patients? And how do we, you know, we were just hearing the previous uh, uh, keynote from Optum about, about how they do it. Um, it seems like there needs to be a need to help patients understand, you know, uh, uh, about how data is gonna be used and, you know, these type of errors. So I'll, I'll come back to you in just a bit. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just go over, and I please ask patience for my colleagues over here from, from uh, the official side. But when we look at um, areas like uh, cancer, for example, right? And, and Patrick, uh, excuse me, Porrick, Porrick Ward, the head of commercial operations for Roche Pharma. Um, I know that you're leading uh, the area of breast cancer. And, and you know, do we have, it's a very similar question I'm asking Francesco, do, do we have the conditions to deliver uh, that you know, social economic benefits with this regulation? Thanks, Ray. I, I think we could. Um, and it cer certainly have worked in breast cancer in the past. Um, I started working for Roche about 20 years ago. I should say, first of all, people might wonder why somebody from a cosmetics company is talking about all of this. That's the other Roche. The one that I work for is a Swiss company, a 125-year-old Swiss company. And I think it's still correct to say that we're the, the leading private investor in healthcare research and development in the world. <clears throat> it's about 15 billion Swiss francs a year, 15 billion euros a year. Um, we, we've made good progress in things like breast cancer. What, what we do as a company when we get access to data is to try and understand, first of all, disease biology. In other words, what causes a disease to happen in the first place? and how might that differ from person to person. Um, we've made good progress in that in breast cancer over the years, but not nearly as much as we could have. Where we have made more progress is in lung cancer, though. When I started working for Roche, we thought about lung cancer broadly as being three different kinds of diseases. And we could observe that yeah, when, you treat some, when you treat some patients, some of them seem to do reasonably well and would survive and thrive for some time, but most didn't. And it wasn't really obvious why. Today, we know that there are at least, at least 20 different types of lung cancer. And we, we've been able to identify that by 
analyzing huge quantities of data, meaningful data, at, at, at an enormous scale. And, you know, I look at things like, um, there's one particular form of, of, of lung cancer, it's about three or four percent of the patients. When I started working in Roche, we didn't have a medicine for it, and the median survival for patients with that disease was about six months. Right? When you can understand what the driver of the mutation of the tumor is, is what's causing the tumor to grow, then you can intervene. So we were able to develop a medicine for it. And today, with ours, and there's others available as well as Roche's one, people stay alive and well, healthy, for five, six years. We're, we're still actually trying to find out how long, how long that will all go. Uh, but that's what, we're, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about trying to figure out what causes diseases to to progress the way they do, so that we can, first of all, identify patients who may have that form of disease quite quickly, and then to intervene with a good treatment. And then, hopefully, using, using data to help healthcare systems follow those patients up. Because the other part we forget about sometimes, you need to actually follow up patients, and, and, and patients moving around healthcare systems, the data is often lost. So, yeah, I look at, I look at the, the, uh, the opportunity that we have together, starting with the fact that it needs to begin with the, 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 the value for the individual citizen or the individual patient, and then thinking about collectively what we can do together. The, the European Union, with the population we have and the healthcare systems that we have, is like no other in the world. And so we, 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 we don't do much work like this in the European Union today. A lot of it is done in the US, but we could do more in Europe. Uh, Porik, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, we had a uh, discussion, I think, over dinner uh, a while back, and I think you said something that shocked me: that um, uh, that if diagnosed early, you can still lead a very healthy life, uh, and uh, it is very much treated if you have cancer, right? And and I think this is the advancements in research that we need, and that could be, you know, empowered by the uh, European Union, and. Uh, in my opinion, when I look at this uh, regulation, we're going to look back, all of us, in about 10 years, and I think of everything that the European Commission has produced, it's going to be this European health data space regulation that will be remembered. And I want to come to you, uh, Sandra Galina. Uh, you're the Director General of uh, DG Santé. Welcome. And I know you've had a great uh, uh, a career to date, and uh, we don't have time to talk about it, but you have played an important role in negotiating some important things, you know, in the areas of trade, for example. And um, I wanted to ask you, you know, you've been hearing, you know, the views of, of my fellow panelists and the opening statements that were made. Uh, what thoughts would you like to bring? Uh, good morning, everybody. Nice to see, uh, I would say, an audience. Nice to see Honorable Sokol next to me because he is the rapporteur of this uh, good piece of law. And also, I was very nice. Uh, was very nice to see Anka here. We have had, um, I would say, exchanges, um, and, and I must say, patients are very important for us in DG Santa. Now, um, may I say to you? Uh, <laughs> I, I think that it was very good I arrived and there was a good um, long description of the benefits that we will get out of uh, the European health data space. I think that for the time being there is a lot of conversation concerning, I would say, uh, futuristic ideas, which I am very attached to, like AI being applied on the basis of data and, and discovering things like even molecules. You know, this morning in the Financial Times there was a very good arc article about these synthetic molecules. We, we have discovered one with Roberto Viola, who is my accomplice in this, in this thing during the COVID uh, era. Now, um, Good things happen, uh, so good to see that there are benefits by linking data, by doing things. This needs to be, become a bit more prominent because, of course, our first concern as regulators is how to protect. Huh? So this is where we have a long conversation going. And I would say that the HDS should become a real game changer. Uh, hopefully it will be remembered, let's hope so, like many other things I did. Um, and I hope it will be remembered for the, for the good reasons, meaning that it will provide more data and it will provide more efficient and quality access. So, let me say to you, of course, Anka is right, it needs to provide this 
to get to the final ontological meaning of, all, of it all, which is better treatment for patients. It's very good to have Roche here that uses, I would say, the data quite well. We, we, we know the companies, uh, I would say. I was surprised you had to distinguish yourself because I couldn't even, not even think of the other one, but okay, fine. Um, so for me, obviously, the final goal is the patient and it's treatment of the patient with the most innovative means and I'm sure that EHDS can contribute to that. Um, but the game changer is also, and here I think that Honorable Sokol will help me in this, is that the patients will become, I would say, also a centerpiece, meaning that they will be owners of their, uh, of their data, not in the sense that, you know, opt-outs and that sort of thing, we can discuss about that. I'm more for gathering a lot of data and giving protection to the data. Uh, this is the, the proposal of the Commission is still on the table. We think that by giving a lot of safeguards, we can have the largest amount of data collected, uh, and, and, and that is the beauty of it. Uh, but the patients will also be able to transport this data to go across. So let me say there is also this famous European dimension where you take your data and you go and you do good things um, everywhere. So let me say new therapeutics, having the possibility of portability of your data, of having your data traveling with you. And by data, I mean also the fact that you will be not duplicating your uh, tests because, you know, even now the interoperability within the member states is not so good. So let me say between member states, we will see that the interoperability will be good. And I hope that as a ricochet, we will have interoperability between the hospitals within one, uh, one country. But I want to be very clear. We constantly need to reassure and trust is the word that comes out, reassure everybody that we want to have protection of the data. These are very sensitive data we're talking about. At the same time, I also want to reassure those who are thinking that secondary use is important and, you know, that the Commission is looking at that as a real game changer for the innovations of the future. So I was very glad to follow the... and perhaps precede also Honourable Sokol, who will be helping me in this thrust to put the patient at the center, but also collect meaningful data to have innovation. And uh, before we go to the uh, European Parliament, just another question, if I may. Uh, we have the European Health uh, Data Regulation, uh, Data Space Regulation, in the middle of many other uh, regulations. AI Act, Data Act, Data Governance, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. AI Act and maybe the conflicts we're seeing with the MDR. Yeah, uh, yeah. Will we be able to manage all of this and juggle all this? By definition. Yeah, I okay. mean, by definition, <laughs> we need to be able to manage. Um, the issue is that we are 27 member states. This is not an easy entity. And this is where I think we also are the melting pot of solutions that can apply to the rest of the world. So let me say it's a bit more laborious, but we can be really the platform, look at the COVID pass, you know, we can be the platform for things to happen um, in the world. So it's very important to remember that perhaps it takes a bit longer, but we, we provide solutions also beyond our borders, really beyond the borders of the EU. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And we have ambition to do that. Good, good. And speaking of ambition, I'm going to have a question for you on where do we go in the future, but I'll come back to you. Uh, and I uh, want to now talk to the European Parliament, uh, Mr. Sokol, Thomas Sokol. Thank you for being here. Thank you for also joining us uh, uh, at the uh, evening uh, dinner as well. And uh, I wanted to just ask you very much that you are a co-rapporteur in, in Envy and uh, you're leading these discussions uh, on the European Health Data Space uh, re Regulation. And, and I just wanted to say that I think our perception is that things are moving very fast. I think there was a view that we will just never get this out in time before the end of the mandate, but it's moving very quickly on both sides of Council and the Parliament, and that's good to see, and it's good to see that, that the politics at the moment, at least, is being kept out, and people are looking <laughs> at, at the job. Well, at, <laughs> exactly. Well, you can make some comments on that uh, as well, but what you've heard as well, and, and you know your insights uh, uh, on the discussions, I really would like you to just expand and share it with our audience here. Today. 
Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, this is definitely a game changer. It could be a game changer if we do it right. And this is not something that happens often in the European Union, especially on health. We don't have a lot of legislation on health in the European Union because, this, as you know, this is primarily a national competence. But this is something which I think is very important. And uh, to be truthful, I think this is the most important piece of health legislation that we will be able to adopt by the end of this term, since, uh, of course, we are all waiting for the pharma legislation. But I think knowing how it works in the Parliament with, with the Council, I don't think it's realistic, sorry to say that, uh, to have this before the before the elections. So, uh, so definitely health data space is the one that we should strongly focus on now. On what you said actually about politics being kept out of it, we, we were able to do it at, until this point. Now things become trickier. So we were really, I had meetings with 60, 70 stakeholders, I think, uh, in the last several months. And the, I use these uh, different points of view to really, to really do, uh, make a uh, first draft, which is really balanced, I think, which takes uh, into account both da data protection, privacy protection on one side, but also the needs, needs of the patients and the needs to use the data on the other. So try to bring all of this together. We also had already discussions with all other political groups, but I'm sorry to say now that we actually have the first draft, and we saw this in the first uh, enemy meeting on this afterwards, that now populism in, is kind of creeping in. And, that's, and, and, that's, and that's, that's always a problem in the parliament. I think within the parliament that will be the biggest, the biggest challenge. And I have to say one of the big problems, I will be very blunt on this, is that some people try to to score political points on this uh, putting industry on one side and patients on the other. So this is the narrative of some colleagues in the parliament. I wouldn't say from which side of the parliament, but I think you can, you can guess that. Uh, so, there's, so, 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 so we even had some people saying, which is completely unreasonable and unsound, that, that we should not look at the benefits of the in, on the industry, but benefits of the patients. Mm. On what, and I said, but this is not a dilemma. These things are complementary. I mean, if you want to have research, if you want to have innovation, if you want to have novel things that which were explained now in the in, now by the speakers before me, you need the industry. You cannot. Of course, we, we need public research, especially fundamental research, which is financed from public purse, from by universities, research institutes, etc. But if we want to commercialize something, to create something which will be put in practice, which will be concretely used to benefit the patients, we need the industry. And not to mention the fact that we are not alone in the world, we are not an island, so if we do not uh, uh, bring innovation, if we do not bring research to Europe, it will go elsewhere. The US is the prime example, but also China, other areas as well. So, so definitely, so we need to think about how to use the industry, how to use research innovation and all the potential it has to actually bring benefits for patients and not to put this thing, not to put this on, on opposite sides. So this is, I think is, is very important. On the opt out and, and that thing, that will be, that, that will be the most uh, challenging thing. I think the most challenging issue, this is the area where some po political groups want to, score, want to score points. And I think this is important. So, on one, so what we want is to have as much data as possible. So, so if we just, so if we, if, we don't, if we have very limited amounts of data, then the whole system is useless. Then we don't have to do it at all. But if we want to have large uh, amounts of data, we cannot have a consent-based system. So I'm, I'm telling this openly because if, if you ask, patients to give consent every single time for every sec request for secondary use of data, that you just not have enough people. If you have an opt-in system where you also need to get people to proactively say that they want to be part of the system, experience from some member states that have this, show this, that this also doesn't work in practice. Not that people do not want to help other people, but you know how psychology is. It's very hard to get people to proactively do something for some kind of an abstract system for some indirect, uh, indirect benefit for somebody else. So it, it just doesn't work. So I think if we want to engage the patients and we want, we want to give them the say also on the secondary use of data, but also have uh, large quantities of data, then the opt-out system is the best way. So that people who do not really strongly do not want to be part of the system can decide not to be. But, but, but to go further than that will definitely destroy the whole system and, and make it impossible for us to have those quantities of data that we need. And, it, and this is unfortunately some, something that some people, as I said, in the parliament still don't understand, but we are working on this, on this to explain this. So I think this is very important. Also one, thing, uh, also, one thing which is important that the parliament also suggests is stronger funding, stronger financing from centralized level. We know that this, this is also something that member states will request, but I think this is very important because, for instance, 
if what, the, what, what was envisaged in the original proposal that national recovery and resilience plans that we already have are the main, one of the main sources of funding for this, that, that will not work in practice because these national plans were made before health data space regulation was, uh, was presented. So if, we want to have real, if you want to have real focus, if you want to have this implemented within some reasonable time frame, then definitely we will need stronger funding from the, from the EU level. And also, and I think this will also be important for the member states. Also, what will, what will be very important is that the existing systems that we have, like in Finland, for instance, but in some other countries, are incorporated into this, so that we don't create something new, com bureaucratically top-down from scratch, something completely new that everybody now has to learn how to adapt to the new system, but that, that we create uh, protocols and standards that the existing systems can be incorporated in. And I think this is, ve this is very important if we want to have this, this, uh, faster impl this, this fast implementation as, uh, as soon as possible. We know that member states will push, will want to have a very lo long period for the actual implementation, for the, for the transposition of this. Uh, we, will we, we understand that, th that it will take some time, maybe a bit longer than the Commission proposed, but not as long as member states will have, so, I, I, so probably in the negotiations we'll find some middle ground. So maybe three or four years, yes, but not nine or ten years, something, something like that. Uh, and what is also very important is what was already mentioned by the Director General, is that uh, we also expect, of course this is primarily done when we speak uh, of EU health legislation for cross-border situations. But definitely what we will have is a spillover effect. So in cases where you have countries like Germany where healthcare is regional competence or federal state competence, not the central state competence, they, and they, they have problems of interop interoperability within their national system. We also, of course, if, when we create this, elect this electronic exchange, uh, electronic health record and the European exchange format, so common standard, how this uh, data should be gathered and, f and structured and used. Of course, this will also be applicable within member states. So, 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 so it will not just be that we will be able to exchange data between different member states, but also between different regions, between different regional healthcare systems within member states, between different hospitals, between different hospitals who are contracted by different health insurance funds, etc. So this is also this is also something which is very important. So I think so. So, so I think there will be a lot of challenges here, but what, the crucial thing is that we make sure that we communicate how all of this benefits the patients, not just primary use of data, but also maybe even more importantly, long-term secondary use of data, and that they try to all work together, and also to try to put pressure on those who want the, to use this uh, to score some political points to prevent, them, to prevent this from happening. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And uh, at least the good news when I listen to you, I'm comforted because all the points you've listed we can find solutions with council. I think there, you can you know, overcome them and, and get to some sort of agreement. The populism side that's creeping in is worrying. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we need to maybe speak up more as industry and as NGOs to communicate the benefits of uh, this regulation. And maybe I can come back to you, uh, Francesco. Maybe I can ask you, uh, just very bluntly, what are you going to do with the data? Uh, right? How is it going to be? How is it going to be used? And uh, you know, that we're running a little bit out of time, so maybe I could also throw another question at you as well, okay. uh, at the same time, if you don't mind, and ask you. Uh, you know, let's imagine we've got the EHDS in place. Where else should we go? Uh, from here. So if you can answer those two important questions okay. for me. Two questions. What we are going to do? I, I think. The answer comes from my right, and uh, I think we can reimagine all the value chain, and for sure you address the most important, which is the discovery part, uh, and even in predicting, I mean, there are diseases, uh, we are in a cancer fight on one hand, and we can go really pre precision medicine, working myself on CAR-T at the moment, it's impressive how we show chronic disease that we can move to cure, um, but let's think about things that we are not able to really deal on big scale, like Alzheimer. So, which at the moment that the disease is manifested is very, most impossible to cure at this point in time. Uh, and perhaps we can go a step forward to identify which are the characteristics that we have before. But more practical also on, on clinical trial recruitment, how we can have a bit more equal recruitment 
uh, when we have able to use data identification patients in that we can then in the supply chain, we can speed up with digital twins how we, we imagine and we produce. I mean, there is a quite question, big question on, on production at this point in time in manufacturing of, of, of medicine. And, and even on the commercial side, when you think about real world evidence gathering, most of our products we bring on the market with the clinical trials and then you stop. And with real world evidence, you can follow up. You can even start earlier and reimagine also contracting with, with um, reimbursement funds on value based and, and not only on pay at the beginning, but just and, and on the other side for us continue to monitor how it's the performance of the medicine during the lifetime of the medicine. So this is all, I've tried to go over the value chain very fast. Uh, on the second, when we, uh, where we can go for the, I mean, there is a big question on the funding and implementation uh, of the, well, when it's approved the European Health Data Space is not implemented. Um, I mean, there is a bit of a fear from, from our perspective, do we go in two kind of, uh, I mean, Champions League and Second League on the implementation of such, um, for such a system where you have country with available funding, country with less available funding, I think the European Union should uh, uh, think about it. Um, harmonization. Uh, I mean, I think perhaps we are all born a child of the implementation of GDPR, but in general, uh, all the regulation, and, and you were telling for sure, and by design, but there is a lot of regulations are coming in this, in this space at this point in time, and, and there needs to be the interplay and, um, and for sure the harmonization is important that, that we have for, for, for breaking the silos and, and moving forward where we are and have implement, consistent implementation throughout Europe that we don't have at the moment. Now, thank you, Francesco. And I think uh, I had this discussion with you and, and you shared this with me. I was, I was quite uh, taken aback uh, that there is so much data sitting in the public sector, right? And if you look at it, it can look incomprehensible noise. And when uh, uh, your industry comes, it, you can create quality out of it. Yeah. Uh, you can you know, m categorize it and have it make sense where it can feed the AI algorithms. And it's not an easy thing to do. And no, it's a I costly mean. thing to do. Uh, so you know, I think that value that, that's being brought to that, to that data is, is quite a critical thing. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we, we are, I mean, we are landing, we are just one company, but with federated approach, with, with data not leaving the sites, but just harmonized, just sharing of algorithms for analysis, with win-win from, uh, let me say, hospital side and also of industry side, and then try to avoid the one point of failure of, of, the, uh, of the security of the data. Um, I think we were building now, so we have built an honor in the hematology, um, yeah, a network with 55,000 patients in multi-moment anoma, which is the biggest one. It's a big effort, and we are only one. I think if you, if you add forces in that, I think much more is possible. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, Anke, I want to come to you. I'm just going to keep the order as well. You've heard the statement from uh, the Honorable MEP, worrying that this is going to be, you know, uh, politicized, populism is creeping in. Um, uh, you know, can patients raise their voices and, and, and let, you know, officials hear uh, why this is so important? Uh, uh, is there, you know, uh, such uh, dichotomy in, in getting the treatments from industry to help with, with patients? What are your thoughts? I think it's very unfair to be instrumentalized to begin with. Um, Patients are the ones who can speak for patients, and we are out there and we are being heard, and I do want to acknowledge that a lot of our concerns have been heard both in the preparation phase and in the, in the European Parliament's report. So this has to be said, and I do want to thank Mr. Sokol for making through his amendments the EHDS regulation more patient-centric. So this has to be said. Um, the second thing that must be said is that fundamentally patients are not against sharing their data. Um, we, we, our community, wants to share their data because we realize that this sharing is the only way to advance uh, scientific progress. Thirdly, we are not against anybody. 
we are well aware of the interdependencies. Um, I'm here to, you know, tell you what we need, um, and uh, in return, I hope that we can get better solutions. This is how it works. Um, that's why I said we need a needs-driven um, EHDS that produces innovation, that answers real questions, real problems of real people. Now, you had asked me before, Ray, um, what are um, something about trust? How do we establish trust? And I'll give you four answers because I had time to write them down while <laughs> others are speaking. Just do keep in mind we have a five minute clock there. <laughs> Very short, a few words. One, uh, representation and governance. Two, transparency of how the data is used. Three, people do have to have an opt-out. I know, you know, from a data perspective, it can uh, reduce the quality and diversity of the data, but psychology, again, if you don't give people an out, you may not have an in. And you don't want to end up in a situation where people are afraid to go to the doctor or to enroll in trials or whatever because they're afraid of what happens to their data. Um, and then the fourth one is we need investment in health literacy. We need to bring people along. Um, if you want patients to cooperate with your data needs, train them. And healthcare professionals too. And healthcare professionals yeah. too, yes, absolutely. Anke, thank you very much, and I hope we'll have continued discussions on what does that opt-out look like. There is opt-out in, in Finland. It, it, it's very narrow and very exactly. defined. But what does that look like? And, and Park, let me come to you. I know ta the time is clicking, and uh, maybe you can quickly let us know, what are you going to use the data? How are you going to use it? And, and where do you think you know, we should be looking at outside of the EHDS for the next commission? Wow. And, I have and you can stick, maybe question. stick with the first one then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I would actually have stuck with the first one anyway, okay. because I think this is just so significant and there is so much work to be done now that we really need to focus on making sure that it happens. What we're going to do with the data is what I described before. That's, that's what we do. And I know this, this question of, you know, I, the, the picture I painted is a very rosy one and it, it's real. Right? And it's possible to do all of those things. And yes, there's, a, there's the, 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 you know, the, the other side of the coin as well. You know, the, the, the worry and the doubt about how the data is going to be used, how it's going to be treated and so on. I would only say for those who are, are concerned about that and what we as an organization might do, or indeed I, I think it's true of any of the research-based industry, I would say you should know that we know that without data, we can't survive. And so we treat data as an absolutely precious thing. Um, and, and, you know, you, you might say, well, he would say that, and I, of course I would, but I would also invite everybody to look at what we do. You know, we're now on 127 years of this, and our track record in making sure that we treat data well, that we respect all of our privacy and other obligations that we use it for the, the, for the purposes that it was designed. We have always done that, and we know that we always have to. No, no, thank you very much. And I think Commissioner Breton the other day was, was highlighting it was European pharmaceuticals that helped with the vaccines in the MRI. It was, it was done here in Europe. So it's important to highlight that and imagine we can do more. I, we're running out of time, but I just want to give you both the, the last final say. I want to ask you a question. I'll just give you the time and, and, and let us know your thoughts uh, in, in a couple of minutes of what you heard or what you want to say to our community. I would like to say, and it's in reply to what Honorable Sokol was saying, there was, a, there was very limited, um, I would say, pharmaceutical legislation. Not so sure, I, I totally agree. But let me say, this mandate for the Commission has been characterized by the health union uh, principle, uh, European health union principle, which goes well beyond the huge package on the cross-border health threats regulation, which has tried to fix some principles concerning preparedness. We are now going into European health data space, which is the other side of the coin of the pharma review. So let me say to you, I personally feel that these two files are joined at the hip because we are sitting on a pile of data in the public sector. And let me say to you, patients are important, but so is the health 
professionals. Health professionals, I was pleased to hear that they were very happy to see the work improved by the linking of the data, but let me say at the moment that what they can see ahead of them is more work and perhaps not, not clear what the return of that more work is. Um, Europe has basically a public health. Huh? Public health means that data are collected at every level. I was in the United States. I know what it means not to have that and to, to have to buy your data from companies. So yes, com uh, companies know how expensive it is uh, data. So I suspect that you also think that I am thinking that this is a good thing for, for industry and I would like to have some returns for the pharma review. So at the end of the day, we all have to play for a digital transformation. Huh? This is the, the thing we need to think that without digital and it's not just economic economics, but it's the, especially the well-being of the patients, you know, uh, without going to, into an orphanization of all diseases, we need to think that, you know, personalized medicine is what we will be heading to towards, especially Alzheimer, when you have to take your pills your own, you know, perhaps you need some, some way to have uh, some AI next to you helping in that, whether it is blisters or a small robot, we will see. Uh, but, you know, we are going towards a demographic situation where digitalization is, is crucial. I'm having quite a lot of discussions for the European semester because what Honorable Sokol was saying is right. The recovery funds are for the internal part of the, of the health system. Some member states have put a lot of money for the digitalization of the health systems out of the recovery funds. Others had already started this process, so they're putting fewer funds. But what it is clear is that the interoperability between the member states needs to be funded at the European level. Eh? We are not going to dump this uh, into the recovery funds. There will be some uh, grey areas, as you may imagine. So for me, digitalization, the transformation, achieving a health union where there is more equity. Because, you know, access for all in an affordable way means also equity. And this is a really a precious salt I leave for you. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And honourable member of the European Parliament, Mr. Yes. Sokol, please. Thank you. Uh, just to, to, to make reference to what was uh, said before, yes, I mean, the Commission has really done a lot in terms of building the European Health Union, so we, now we have the, the Euros beating cancer plan, which is also a big, yeah. big yeah. breakthrough, big, I think, yeah. uh, which, and, uh, something which is very, very important. Also, we have the, 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 the rules on the cross-border health threats. Uh, we have the strengthened uh, mandate for the ECDC and them, and also creation of new HERA. So all of these things which are directly linked in, in building Resili for, with building resilience for future health, public health crisis, all of this has really been a, a big achievement by the Commission. But now, when we speak about other, more long-term things, even more, and which, which are which are more structural things, which are not just related necessarily with public health threats, then I think health data space is the crucial, the crucial thing that we have at the moment. Also, on what was uh, what was said is very important. So those four th things emphasized by Anka, I think, uh, at least that's, that's what I think is that we. In our first draft report, we actually addressed all of them. From the strengthening of the patients in the governance, the opt-out, uh, the funding, special rules on, strength, uh, on strengthening the, the, the digital health literacy, especially between, within, within the healthcare professionals, which can sometimes be a problem, but also with patients. I think we really tried to address all of these things, and I think that we uh, uh, were able to achieve this. Uh, so, I, so, I, so I think what is crucial is to focus on the benefits for the patients, on all of the th things that we can achieve with this, not to create these false dichotomies between the interests of industry of the patients, but to really all, uh, try all, all of us to try to work together to really have, the, have this done, because we don't have a lot of time. And we want to have this finished. We need to have the political agreement within the parliament before summer, mm. July at the latest, to, so that we can start negotiations with the council in September to have the final, the final agreement by the end of this year, because when we enter 2024, then it's, everybody will be focused on, on getting re-elected and then all bets are off. So, yeah. so, so we really have to move, move quickly. We have to all work together. And also we have to do uh, two things. We have to put pressure on some political groups in the parliament not to succumb to populism. This is very important, especially since we have two committees there. And I think 
at least my opinion is that some people from public health committee are maybe better, more knowledgeable about this issue and the, and, and the importance of this than maybe some people in the other committee who is in charge. And I think that this, we have to strengthen this communication to explain to the people from the C uh, Civil Liberties Committee how all of this benefits health and why this is important and that we do not unravel the whole system. And the second point which is important is that we also have to bring this to the attention of some member states because some member states are really, really, really advanced in this and they are really active on the file already, like big, big member states like Germany, like France. The Spanish presidency is already preparing for, the, for when they take over for the negotiations in the second half of the year. But there are some other member states, many smaller member states, who are still not aware of this. So we also have to put pressure and we have to raise awareness on, on part of all of them so that, we, that, that they already start discussing this in the Council, that we also have the Council position as soon as possible so that we can really have this finished by the end of this year. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we've run out of time, and I ask everyone to please stay for the rest of the program. I invite our moderator back to let you know what the rest of the program is as we vacate the stage. And thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I need to leave. Thank you. It was nice meeting you. Thank you, Ray.